I call the meeting of the Environment and Natural Resources Finance and Policy Committee to order. A quorum is present. Um, Representative Purcell, have you had a chance to review the minutes for March 14th? And if so, can you move their approval? Yes, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I am reviewing them now, and I would like to move their approval. Representative Purcell moves the minutes for March 14th, 2023. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign, and the motion prevails, and the minutes are approved. Um, we're going to move some things around on the agenda, and first up is going to be House File 1828 um, from Chair Hansen. Um, Chair Hansen, would you like to move your bill? Yes, Madam Chair and members, uh, I would move House File 1828 be laid over for possible inclusion uh, in a Bowser bus bill, maybe. And I believe, uh, Mr. Chair, you have the, an A1 author's amendment as well. I do. I would move the A1 amendment to get the bill in the shape I would like. Uh, this provides some clarifying adjectives uh, in the bill and uh, adds a definition of restored prairie that used to be in law. Uh, Representative Hansen moves the A1 amendment to get the form in the bill he would like. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say no, and the motion prevails. The A1 amendment is adopted. Representative Hansen, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, members, uh, 1828 as amended uh, is a policy bill uh, that relates to the Board of Water and Soil Resources and Soil and Water Conservation Districts. Um, I have two uh, uh, testifiers with me. Uh, John Jaschke, the Executive Director of the Board of Water and Soil Resources, and then Sheila Viani uh, with the Minnesota Association of Soil and Water Districts. And if Mr. Jaschke could come forward. Um, great. We'll move testimony. First is uh, Director Jaschke from the Minnesota Board of Water and Soil Resources. Welcome back to the committee. Uh, Director Jaschke, please say your name and then proceed with your testimony. Uh, th thank you, Madam Chair. Members, John Jaschke, Executive Director of Board of Water and Soil Resources. Ms. Uh, Director Jaschke, can you move the microphone a little bit closer? It's a little bit difficult to hear you. Thanks. Is that better? That's much better. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as uh, the author indicated, uh, this is a bill that is, has a several comprehensive changes to various parts of our authorities and our programs. I'll go through them uh, somewhat briefly. If you have any questions, feel free to ask any questions. I will try and note the, the pieces that were adjusted through the amendment as well. On page two, there is a provision that updates the Camp Ripley program that we work with the National Guard on to acquire conservation easements in concert with their interests to, for, for both natural resources as well as military purposes. We have a adjustment on the middle of page two that would allow us to enter into grant agreements and other agreements with tribal nations as well as others to bring federal money and or other resources to these enterprises that would help us do our work. Um, at the top of page three, we have a provision that allows the agency to bring together groups in a voluntary fashion to identify and uh, update uh, conservation practices. This expands the suite of those practices that would be uh, reviewed and uh, developed and then shared. Uh, on the middle of page three, uh, a similar provision for native vegetation. We have a responsibility uh, that has been linked to policy language in the Environment and Natural Resources Trust Bill as well as the Outdoor Heritage Fund that requires us to establish these standards and this language would allow us to do that in a more explicit way and transparent way as well as bringing expertise from others and acknowledging that in the process. On the page three and four, there's a conservation easement um, uh, account that we are seeking an adjustment for and this is the first piece is just to update the terminology in the top of page four on uh, the center of page four this would allow us to use this fund on a as needed basis only to repair and replace structures that are uh, either damaged or have need of repair uh, the ability to tap that fund so that we can use it uh, before that situation gets worse and costs more down the road um, on page five, <clears throat> there is a uh, establishment of a habitat friendly utility program and there's also a budget recommendation in the governor's budget on this as well. Allows us to work with utility companies and, and I, we've got a pilot underway with, uh, with solar installations to establish habitat, specifically pollinator habitat in and around those areas and identify um, that benefit to the public that those private landscapes can also provide in addition to the energy benefits. 
Um, this would allow us to do this uh, with other uh, utility operators, uh, transmission lines, uh, uh, pipelines, things like that. Uh, the, the bottom of page three, there's a Habitat Enhanced Landscape Program. This is the sort of a companion in some ways to the Longs to Legumes uh, piece that was passed earlier uh, out of this body and onto the floor. Um, that would allow us to work in neighborhood areas and, and in public landscapes along boulevards and things to establish, again, uh, native species uh, aimed at you know, biodiversity and pollinator-specific types of practices. Uh, beginning in the middle of page six, there are some uh, a package of changes here that would uh, adjust the state's uh, cost share program that the soil water conservation districts carry out uh, to allow it to be more comprehensive and also to make it work uh, in a more streamlined fashion so we can bring uh, federal money that has become available in bigger ways than previously through the Inflation Reduction Act as well as some expected funding from the state via the governor's budget. Um, and there was, I think, one or two adjustments to that in the, in the language that is in the amendment. Um, and I think we're, we're fine with that language in the amendment. The one that we've noted and communicated to the author is that the rule language uh, that would repeal some of the rules that are specific to this program, we'd like to take another look at that to make sure they fit with the way the statute has been adjusted as well. Um, so I'll just page through to that to uh, top of page nine. This establishes a soil health practices program, uh, you know, for the types of things that we know are important for agricultural producers to provide, you know, public benefits in form of uh, climate sequestrate climate and carbon sequestration as well as uh, water quality, and of course, if it's done right, it can be a product, product production benefit as well for those producers. Uh, this creates a mechanism to put those those funds into, and there is a recommendation in the governor's budget for this as well. Um, on to top of page 10, I see there was an additional uh, item here identified in the amendment to, to define restored prairie. We support that. You can see there's also a grassland definition that's also included in this definition uh, and would allow us to use those definitions in our reinvest in Minnesota program, which has been around for quite a long period of time and has very successfully accomplished a number of or hundreds, actually, about thousands of landscape restorations via that easement program. Uh, we also are looking to create a working lands uh, easement program, which is listed there at the bottom of page 10 to, again, bring in some federal funding uh, to match some state funding. Um, we look at the bottom of page uh, 11. Uh, this is one policy change to the Wetland Conservation Act, it's just a, a mechanism that would allow us to do mitigation for uh, the purposes of both public waters and wetlands and the federal re requirements that go with that. For example, a linear project that crosses a creek, there's wetlands that are impacted as well as maybe some of the creek. We can use this program if the permits allow to mitigate those, uh, those impacts through the wetland banking program. <clears throat> and I think I did miss one other change in the, on the watershed district statute, which is... Um, let me see where that's at now, Madam Chair. Oh, yes, on the bottom of page eight, uh, this would just simply correct uh, what was long held to be the case that watershed district boards, you know, after review and approval by uh, those via public notice, including agencies, would approve their own projects that were petitioned to them. Uh, this just clarifies that that is done by that district board and not the, the state board. Thank you, Madam Chair, for the opportunity to rock through this bill. Thank you, Director Jashke. Next on my list for testimony, I have Sheila Vanny from the Minnesota Association of Soil and Water Conservation Districts. Um, please state your name for the record um, and then proceed with your testimony. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. Sheila Vanny, and I'm, I'm the Assistant Director with the Minnesota Association of Soil and Water Conservation Districts, MASWCD, <clears throat> excuse me, represents the state's 440 elected SWCD supervisors and our over 460 SWCD employees. And I want to just briefly offer our support um, for House File 1828 and thank Chair Hansen for bringing it forward. In particular, the changes to 103C.501 that were highlighted 
are um, are excellent changes that are going to modernize and streamline our state cost share program and the system of contracts that has proven so successful um, as a tool for SWCDs to use to get conservation on the land with um, landowners. Um, I also want to just take the opportunity to point out that we have in the audience with us today several um, participants in our MASWCD Leadership Institute. This is a cohort learning um, experience that spans a, a year and um, every couple months they come together and learn about a different aspect of leadership. And so it's, some of it is instructional, some of it's hands-on learning, and then they bring those skills back to their local SWCDs and communities. And so I just, I just wanted to give a shout out to those folks in the audience, SWCDs from across the state, as well as um, some agency partners from the Board of Water and Soil Resources and our federal partner, the Natural Resource Conservation Service. With that, Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Vanny, and thank you to everyone who, who came to, to St. Paul to see how uh, laws get made. Um, is there anyone else in the audience on that note that would like to testify for or against the bill? And with that, we will go to questions from members. Um, Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, maybe Director Jasky could come back if it's okay. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. Just wanted to get on the record one way or the other. I'm not hearing anybody testifying against the bill today. Uh, wondering if there's any known stakeholders that have uh, been in contact with you or anyone else that you're aware of that does have any kind of concern. Not everybody's able to make it down for a hearing, so just wanted to confirm for the record. Director Jaschke. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Heinzman, no, we do not have anybody that's uh, expressed any opposition to anything in the bill. Thank you. Further questions from members? Um, well, Representative Hansen, closing comments then. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, House File 1828 uh, is a, a comprehensive Bowser bill. Uh, we may consider moving this separately uh, in the near future. Uh, Bowser did flag one provision, and uh, Director Jaschke mentioned on that it was in the repealers, and we'd like to keep the provision that provides for inspection. So I had wanted to retain that as a rule. We may be coming with language to have that clarified as a statute that gives the, the boards the responsibility for that. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the only change I think that's coming. Uh, and if we can get that resolved, uh, maybe that. Otherwise, uh, my, I renew my motion that it be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. Representative Hansen renews his motion that House File 1828 as amended be laid over for possible inclusion in a Bowser bus or omnibus bill, and the bill is laid over. Um, next up, I'm not seeing uh, Representative Hollins, and so we are going to proceed to House File 2774 um, related to the Sustainable Forest Resources Act. Um, Chair Hansen, don't go anywhere. Um, and in the meantime, would you like to move your bill? I would move that House File 2774 uh, be referred to Ways and Means, uh, laid over for possible inclusion. General, general register? General register. Uh, great. Representative Hansen, to your bill. House File 2774, uh, if you look in your packet, there is a handy report to the governor on the Sustainable Forest Resources Act. I'd encourage you to look through that. Uh, but the purpose of this bill is to provide a vehicle uh, for any uh, future legislation, omnibus legislation uh, moving through during this session. And I know you have Eric Schneck from the Minnesota Forest Resources Council on hand. Um, was Mr. Schneck looking to testify or just? He's just be on hand, okay. Madam Chair. Great. Well, is there anyone in the audience that would like to testify for or against House File 2774? Do we have questions for members? Representative Brand. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Representative Hanson, just a question. Why don't we just repeal the sunset? Representative Hanson. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Brand. Uh, I think sunsets are good uh, to come back and look at these provisions. Uh, this particular one, uh, the reality is we're changing the sunset so we have a vehicle to use uh, for an omnibus bill. And we felt that it would be relatively non-controversial. 
Are there any further questions uh, for the bill or the bill author? Um, well, Representative Hansen, uh, closing comments? I'd ask for your support. Representative Hansen renews his motion that House File 2774 be re referred to the General Register. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say no. The motion prevails. And Representative Hollins is here. So I think we'll go to her bill and I will hand the gavel back to uh, Chair Hansen. Representative Hollins, welcome to the committee. Uh, this is House File 2693. I will move that House File 2693 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. And it looks like you have a DE1 amendment. I will move the DE1 amendment to the bill to get the bill in the shape the author would like. Representative Hollins, can you explain the changes in the amendment briefly? I'm, I'm sorry. Uh Mr. Chair, we're, we're not going to offer the DE1 oh. amendment today. Um, there are some additional changes that need to be made, so. Okay. Thank you. Great. Then we can just move, <laughs> if you could just explain the bill. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Chair Hansen and members of the committee. I appreciate your time today. Um, this bill has been in the making for several years. It is the Zero Waste Grant bill. Um, if you don't know, Minnesota is facing a waste crisis. One key piece of addressing that crisis is investing in an infrastructure to support zero waste economy. This bill creates a grant program for small businesses, nonprofits, and local governments to overcome startup barriers and support their efforts to create reuse systems, reduced waste, and contribute to a circular economy. Um, in particular, the zero waste grant program will invest in source reduction and reuse electronic source reduction and recycling, market development, recycling and composting infrastructure, um, and environmental justice areas and rural communities. Um, it will be focused on because at least 60% of grant funds are required to be spent on projects impacting environmental justice areas, and at least 30% of grant funds are required to be invested in rural Minnesota communities. Um, we, when we were working on this grant, we were very purposeful in not giving specific requirements for what folks want to do because we recognize that Minnesota is a big state and each different area faces different challenges in this zero waste issues and so we want to make sure that it is accommodating any municipality any nonprofit local organizations to really be able to dig in and do the things that they need to do for their communities we know that one size doesn't fit all and so we're trying to um, bring the entire state of Minnesota along with us when we're doing the zero waste work I have several testifiers uh, just two sorry not several a couple of testifiers today and I would um, love to have them come speak as well Okay, first up, Lucy Mullaney, Eureka Recycling. <laughs> Welcome to the committee and state your name for the record. Thank you, Chair Hansen, members of the committee, and Representative Hollins for her leadership on this issue. My name is Lucy Mullaney. I am the uh, Director of Policy and Advocacy at Eureka Recycling. Amid historic supply chain disruptions, intensifying climate crisis, and rampant uh, plastic pollution, there has never been a more, <clears throat> excuse me, a more important time to invest in a circular economy for Minnesotans that prioritizes reduction and reuse. As a mission-based recycler serving Minnesotans and engaging in national and international zero waste work for over 20 years, we can speak confidently to the fact that investments in zero waste infrastructure are investments in a strong, uh, resilient economy, more stable supply chains, good green jobs, and a healthier environment. Our climate crisis is directly correlated to the, an economy that supports linear consumption over circularity. According to the EPA, 40% of our green, greenhouse gas emissions come from linear consumption. So that's pr uh, production, transporting, using, and disposing of material goods. Waste reduction is a powerful climate strategy, and while composting and recycling are cornerstones of that work, there is nothing more impactful in terms of reducing toxics and carbon emissions than not creating more stuff in the first place. The systems of single-use packaging and linear consumption are well-established. 
It is critical that we support opportunities to invest in and build out the alternatives. The zero waste grant program supports these alternatives. This could be as, imp as impactful as helping a school district purchase uh, dishwashers and reusable dishes uh, to move away from single use disposables or a cent central collection and washing station for refillable bottles for small manufacturers. Uh, or a community scale composting program that reduces food waste and creates healthy soil for community gardens. This grant program will help communities get over startup hurdles and set up sustainable systems specific to their situation. Finally, we support the strong definitions laid out for the purposes of this grant program, including definitions for composting, recycling, reuse, and zero waste. These definitions ensure that we close loopholes on false solutions that currently exist in statute and create an opportunity for grant funds to target activities that achieve source reduction and bring us closer to zero waste. Uh, the program is an important step towards a more sustainable economy for Minnesota. We ask for your support and appreciate the consideration of our comments. Thank you. Thank you. Emily Barker, Reuse Minnesota. Welcome and state your name for the record. Thank you, Chair uh, Hansen, Representative Hollins, member of the committee. My name is Emily Barker. I'm the Executive Director of Reuse Minnesota. And I'm here today in support of House File 2693. Reuse Minnesota is a nonprofit dedicated to advancing reuse in our state. Our membership includes repair businesses, resale stores, and rental shops, as well as government entities, nonprofits, consultants, and individuals who support reuse. As we found in our 2022 impact study, Minnesota is home to more than 10,000 businesses that have reuse as a primary function or a significant portion of their business. These businesses account for over 45,000 jobs. Their work help, helps avoid CO2 emissions equivalent to 100,000 gas powered vehicles being removed from the road on an annual basis. By the very nature of the work, reuse reduces the environmental impacts of all the stuff in our lives by cutting out the extraction of new materials and manufacturing of new products. Reuse businesses are also less likely to be exported, meaning the materials and jobs stay local, further reducing the impact of transportation and goods. Reuse decreases the amount of material heading to landfills, which have long-term environmental and financial costs for private waste companies, counties, and the state. This bill supports several aspects of the ever-expanding circular economy. In particular, Reuse Minnesota supports subdivision four and five as they relate to reducing waste through design, developing markets for reused and refurbished goods, and educational programming to encourage reuse. Refurbishing and repurposing goods that still have much life left in them is critical to developing an economy that restores and regenerates the environment. Instead of sending usable goods to the trash, we create opportunities for economic prosperity through repair, rental, resale, and repurposing. One note, we would like to see the word reuse added to the language in subdivision five, so it is very clear that market development projects would be included for reuse businesses. In our impact study, we learned that reuse businesses generate around $5 billion of economic activity in Minnesota each year. We know that much of that economic activity generated through use comes from small businesses. We greatly appreciate the addition of small businesses as potential eligible entities in this year's bill. In a business needs assessment we conducted in 2022, many respondents noted the needed for, need for funding to support their growth into sustainable and flourishing businesses. The funding in this bill is an important investment that will help multiply existing economic activity along with the environmental and social benefits of reuse. In summary, reuse is good for Minnesota's environment and we encourage your support of this bill today. Thank you so very much for your time. Thank you. Uh, Marcus Mills, Community Power. Welcome. You can state your name for the record. My name is Marcus Mills. I am representing both Community Power and the uh, Minnesota uh, uh, Energy, uh, sorry, Minnesota Environmental Justice Table. Thank you. So, uh, Chair Hansen and members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify in support of House File 2693. Uh, my name is Marcus Mills. I work for Community Power. 
um, community power is about people becoming energy decision makers, not just consumers. We need to keep our community's energy options open so we can secure a clean, locally controlled, equitable, affordable, and reliable energy and environmental future. Uh, we thank Representative Hollins for her leadership on this issue and introducing House File 2693, the Zero Waste Grant Program. Amid historic supply chain disruptions, the intensifying climate crisis and rampant plastic pollution, uh, there has never been a more important time to invest in a circular economy for M Minnesotans that prioritizes reduction and reuse. Investments in zero waste infrastructure and investments in a resilient statewide economy, a healthier environment and stable supply chains for Minnesota manufacturers. Our climate crisis is directly correlated with an economy that supports linear consumption over circularity. According to the EPA, 40% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from linear consumption, producing, transporting, using, and disposing of material goods. In 2017, more than 1.8 million tons of waste ended up in our state's landfills, and more than 1.3 million tons went to the incinerator. Yet with proactive legislative action, we can prevent this waste. According to the MPCA, nearly two-thirds of what is landfilled and burned in Minnesota could be reduced, reused, recycled, or composted with improved infrastructure. The systems of single-use packaging, linear consumption, and waste are well established, and it's critical that we support opportunities to invest in and build out the alternatives. This bill creates a grant program for small businesses, nonprofits, and local governments to create reuse uh, systems, reduce waste, and contribute to a circular economy. This bill will uh, source reduction and reuse, electronic resource reduction and recycling, market development, recycling composting infrastructure, and environmental justice, and uh, will concentrate on environmental justice and rural, uh, environmental justice areas and rural communities. Uh, the Zero Waste Grant Program prioritizes reuse and reduction. This could look like something as impactful as helping a rural school, dis uh, school district purchase dishwashers and reusable dishes to move away from single-use disposables. Uh, uh, creating a central collection in West uh, Washington Station or refillable for refillable bottles, and um, it helps reduce uh, food waste and creates uh, healthy soils for urban gardens. This grant program will help communi uh, communities get over uh, some of the hurdles that are set up and set up sustainable uh, systems specific to their situations. This program is a critical step forward. Um, toward a more sustainable economy in Minnesota. We ask for your support with this House File 2693 and appreciate your consideration for our comments. Thank you. Thank you. Doug Carnival, National Waste and Recycling Association. Welcome and state your name for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Doug Carnival, McGranchet Carnival Law Firm, representing the National Waste and Recycling Association. Um, we're here to talk about this zero waste grant program that's being proposed. Um, Minnesota has, a, has successful recycling and organics collection programs that have been led in part and principally by the commitment and investment of the private sector companies that collect, haul, and process organic and recycling wa waste materials across the state for many years. NWRA and its members generally are supportive of grant programs focusing on source reduction and market development. However, our members cannot support the distribution of public funds for the creation of recycling and composting inf infrastructure programs that will likely compete with privately owned assets that are currently serving many of the communities in the state. State funds should only be allocated for infrastructure projects that are necessary to fill the gaps in the existing system and should not be used to create publicly subsidized operations to compete with existing successful public-private partnerships. The bill would prevent the companies that have led the development of our current system from receiving any funds and would instead provide public funds to select few direct competitors that operate as nonprofits, small businesses, or local government entities. Additionally, we're concerned that the legislation creates some redundant and conf conflicting definitions of the terms that are already in statute, like recycling, composting, and a new definition of zero waste that we find to be 
uh, problematic to meet. Uh, this legislation creates a process for reviewing grant applications that is also redundant. The MPCA already has established processes for reviewing grant applications. As part of this existing process, all st solid waste projects receiving any type of funding are currently required to be analyzed for their impacts on public and private solid waste facilities that are in existence um, under Minnesota statutes and rules. Furthermore, infrastructure requests that may be, may be appropriately handled by the capital bonding process rather than the appropriation process. In conclusion, we encourage you to limit the grant funding to source reduction and market development of projects, not infrastructure and equipment, and allow private and public partnerships to continue leading the development of needed solid waste infrastructure. Uh, we will look forward to working with Representative Hollins uh, as this bill goes forward. We've submitted some written comments and encourage you to review them, and we thank you for your, your time. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who'd like to testify for or against the bill? Welcome to the committee. Please state your name for the record. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Representative Hollins. My name is Maria Jensen. I'm the uh, Environment Health and Safety Specialist at Repowered, formerly known as Tech Dump. And I'm here to testify in support of House File 2693. Repowered is a nonprofit electronics recycler and refurbisher in the Twin Cities. We provide fair chances for people, the planet, and technology. Through our 18 month work readiness program, we provide job training opportunities for community members facing barriers to employment, such as experience with incarceration. Through our recycling and reuse efforts, we keep over 3 million pounds of electronics out of landfills and incinerators each year. By doing so, we protect our air and water from toxic pollution like mercury, lead, cadmium, polychlorinated biphenyls, and dioxins, just to name a few. Additionally, our activities reduce carbon emissions by just shy of 5,000 tons of CO2 equivalent per year. This, the same savings of removing um, 1,000 motor vehicles from the road every year. That being said, we can do better. According to the uh, 2021 score report from the MPCA, Minnesota only collects 23.7% of its electronics for recycling leaving the majority to end up in landfills and incinerators. This bill would offer much needed funding to boost projects for recyclers in Minnesota and to build up their processing capacity. And by doing so, create more jobs within the circular economy. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience who'd like to testify for or against the bill? Anyone else? Okay. Members, testimony. Or questions? Representative Heisman. Thank you, Chair. I see that uh, Assistant Commissioner Kadelka is here. Maybe he could pop down for a second. Assistant Commissioner Kadelka, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Welcome and state your name for the record. Chair and committee members, for the record, my name is Kirk Kadelka. I'm Assistant Commissioner with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Heisman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Commissioner, just going through uh, some of the letters that were written, one of them was summed up in testimony, um, positive and negative. We're hearing from folks that have testified today. And if you could address some of the concerns that were mentioned and then maybe some of the positives, if there's a takeaway that you might have to offer the committee. Commissioner Kadelka. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, uh, thank you for the, the question. There's a, a lot here that is very similar to what's in the governor's bill. So we share the, the support of the need for developing our organics industry, our source reduction efforts, and others. And so in that way, this is a, a positive step moving forward. The agency does have some experience in offering grant programs in these areas. For instance, the market development. We are going to continue working with the author and, and supporters to see if we can streamline the grant process to make sure that it, it can be done um, well, uh, much like our other programs. And we'll continue uh, working with the author on advancing the needs for waste prevention, um, organics, and other activities that are in the bill. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. So, 
not necessarily trying to put you on the spot, but mm -hmm. one of the comments was that some of the provisions of the bill are redundant. Some are maybe somewhat confusing and maybe already statutorily defined and these definitions could conflict. Are any of those statements uh, concerning to you or is it uh, something that uh, we should discard? Mr. Kedelka. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, there are some definitions here we'll continue to work with the author on. Uh, for instance, the issues of reuse and others as, as mentioned. And so we're happy to continue to work with the author. Overall, the bill has the same goals. We're working towards the same areas of preventing waste from going to disposal. And this would provide grants to many entities to help make that possible where it isn't today. Numbers. Representative Hollins to close. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, committee members. Um, I just want to echo um, what the commissioner was saying. We've had a lot of really positive conversations and meetings about this bill, and um, I certainly don't see this as being the end. As you can see, the appropriation amounts are blank, so it clearly isn't um, the end for this, this piece of legislation, and we plan to continue working on it and making some edits and um, corrections to get it into the shape that we really want it to be. But I just want to close by saying I do think we've heard from a number of different different um, municipalities, nonprofits, and businesses who say that this is something that they really need. And especially with the amount that we're looking at, which isn't a huge amount, um, but really makes a huge difference to organizations that otherwise are working on a shoestring budget. So just to be able to get some of those programs started to um, you know, create pilot programs to see if this is something that is workable in their communities. Um, I think that this could really be a tremendous asset for those organizations. So I would appreciate your support. Thank you. I renew my motion that House File 2693 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. The bill is laid over. Thank you. Thank you. Next on the list is House File 2368 from Representative Hansen, Minnesota Swan Protection Act established. Um, and Representative Hansen, would you like to move the bill? Thank you, Madam Chair. I would move the House File 2368, uh, the Minnesota Swan Protection Act, be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. And Representative Hansen, I believe you have the A1 author's amendment. Would you like to move the amendment and explain it? Uh, yes. Uh, Madam Chair, I would move the A1 amendment and uh, members, if you'd look at it, it really is redefining resting with protection. So wherever resting was, uh, and this was, I believe, recommended uh, from um, council. So I would move the A1 amendment. Representative Hansen moves the A1 amendment to get the bill in the form he would like. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed say no. The no. Motion, the motion prevails. The A1 amendment is adopted. Representative Hansen, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members. The uh, House File 2368, as amended, uh, we passed off the House floor last year. Uh, this actually is the version that passed off. It is different than the bill that was introduced last year. Uh, the issue of lead in our lakes uh, has been around for a while. Uh, there are bills that are proposing total bans. What this does is it takes a, a, a different approach, uh, defines uh, native swans uh, as the Minnesota trumpeter swan and the or a tundra swan, but does not include a mute swan. It uh, defines designated swan resting areas. And why do we do that? Similar to designating lakes that may have uh, AIS or designating lakes with other particular uh, species, this would designate areas uh, that are more considering of uh, protection, that there would be limits put on the use of lead sinkers on those lakes. Uh, it also provides some provisions. Uh, it increases the restitution value for uh, the illegal taking of a swan, a tundra swan, or a trumpeter swan, uh, increases those, and it also uh, defines the uh, taking those swans in violation of game and fish laws as guilty of a misdemeanor, and there have been swans uh, over recent years that have been taken. Um, it appropriates money 
to provide for education. So we're not just providing the penalty, we're providing educational dollars to reach Minnesotans and then provides a million dollars from the general fund to the PCA uh, for the lead tackle reduction program. So it's an incentive, uh, it's education, and it does have a consequence as well. So I'd ask for your support. I know there are several testifiers. The first one on my list is Carol Henderson. Welcome uh, back to our committee. Uh, Mr. Henderson, please introduce yourself for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to join you today and share some thoughts on the trumpeter swan, uh, species that's very dear to me. Uh, I wrote up the original trumpeter swan introduction plan with Dr. Jim Cooper from the University of Minnesota in 1981. And it's been obviously successful beyond our wildest hopes. And uh, so what I would like to do, to do today is to share some thoughts on this whole issue of how we can provide for a long-term uh, successful management of the swans, conservation of the swans, and some of the other species that they share habitats with, like loons as well. And so I'm looking at maybe a little bit bigger picture than this legislation proposes, but I would like you to think in terms of this big picture approach to an environmental issue that has dogged me. I picked up a dying bald eagle when I was the assistant manager at the Lafayette Pearl Wildlife Refuge in November 1974. That was 49 years ago. And we're still dealing with lead poisoning today. We're still losing eagles. Uh, in 49 years, we haven't managed to get our arms around that problem. I hope it doesn't take another 49 years. I think we can agree that this issue has come far enough that we can agree that uh, things are happening around us that are, we may not be aware of, but I'm going to mention a couple of these today. One is that uh, we have some people who refuse to buy into the argument that we need to use non-toxic fishing tackle or hunting ammo. They consider, continue using lead. And what this is happening uh, with is that it soils the reputation of hunters and anglers for people who can't understand why this is such a problem, why is there such a, a resistance to this change? And so when this image is soiled, it takes away from the image of hunters and anglers as conservationists. They've often been very proud to feel, and I've been a hunter and angler since I was 10, uh, we've been proud of that heritage of conservation. And now that heritage, that feeling of uh, involvement with wildlife is slipping away from that, from the public who realizes that, that this is still a problem and that, that we need to leave the lead behind. And we need hunters and anglers to be leading that charge. They're the ones who can make the change happen. And there are some things changing though in the greater society around us. The Minnesota Pollution Control Agency conducted a survey at the Midwest Sports Show just this past month. And they interviewed 237 people, and 86% of the respondents said it was important to deal with the issue of lead metal in fishing tackle. And 86, uh, excuse me, 75% said they supported phasing out lead fishing tackle out of over 200 people. And then in Greater Minnesota, the MPCA did a survey in 2019, and 65% of those people from Greater Minnesota supported phasing out lead fishing tackle. So it's not like the public is opposing this, but we need to take a bigger picture and see what's good within society and for our sporting traditions. Now, sometimes there are alternatives, and tungsten for fishing tackle is a very interesting one. Do we have any people here from Bemidji today? I don't believe so. Oh, okay. Uh, anyway, Northland Fishing Tackle is a nationally known manufacturer of fishing tackle out of Bemidji. And they've come up with a new line of jigs that they think is going to be a real game changer in terms of fishing tackle 
as an alternative to lead. They're very proud of the, these new products, and you might want to get briefed on them sometime to find out what they're, what they're doing. But it, it's a big move forward by the industry to say, this is where the future is. This is where we're going to be in five or ten years. You need to catch up with us because we're proud of our products. And the same thing is also happening with uh, ammunition manufacturers. And Federal Cartridge locally has been a local leader for many years. And uh, ma ammunition manufacturers across the country are in a race with each other to see who can come up with the best bullets. Now, this is an ad I just found this weekend in the latest Peterson's Hunting Magazine uh, by Seiko. The whole new line of copper bullets. And they're competing with all the other companies. So uh, pass that around if you wish. But this is what's happening. We're, we're in an era where industry realizes that we're in a non-lead future. And we need to be finding creative ways to, f to change that attitude in terms of, of uh, what I would consider a phase-in alternative. To say, how can we make, move this, not right away, but can we move it over time to get people used to the idea? Uh, in 2011, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service did a survey, uh, the U.S. Uh, Hunting, Fishing, and Wildlife Associated Recreation, and they're repeating it again this year, that's 12 years later. They published the Minnesota report, and it said that the average Minnesota angler spends $1,620 per year, 2011, for fishing. Now, suppose the increased cost of the jigs they use went up a few dollars. Suppose an angler spent maybe an extra forty dollars a year for the, the alternative tackle, for the tungsten-based tackle. If it happened, that's less than three percent of the total amount that angler is spending per year. And that's just an excuse that we we need to find out what the real reasons are, and and build work with companies like our own to find out how we can keep promoting their products and find environmentally responsible and non-toxic products. And ever since I found that dying bald eagle, I've worked with trying to reduce eagle mortality through changing from lead. And uh, also Loon, I'm on the board of directors for the National Loon Center, trying to promote responsible loon conservation, protection, and management. And all of this surrounds an era in which I'm still an avid advocate for hunting and fishing, but we need to bring those issues together where we can all agree on what's the best uh, strategy here. <coughs> and now most recently, in the last few years, we've had issues with uh, ammunition manufacturers and, and tackle manufacturers like Water Gremlin in White Bear Lake, and now recently in Federal with lead dust and the people are bringing that home and they're getting it in the kids. We shouldn't be polluting our kids with lead. That's not, that's not necessary. We can get around it by using non-toxic alternatives as, as part of a <coughs> partnership with the, the ammo and, and uh, tackle industries. So if we can really deal with this, I guess I would, I'm really excited about dealing with the trumpeter swan issue. Many of the lakes where they would be affected would also be lakes where loons would benefit from lack of lead. And then also we need to deal with how, how can we address the hunting issues with, with, with lead as well? Now, I was in the DNR back when we made the big transition from shot shells from lead for waterfowl hunting and worked with Roger Holmes and, and Joe Alexander. And, and they did that transition over several years to say, we really need to do this. Well, there was a lot of complaining. <laughs> People weren't happy with it. But you know what? The alternatives we have at, for non-toxic shot shells for waterfowl hunting are incredible today. They're really, really good. And also, now the, those companies are producing shot shells that are non-toxic for upland hunting. So they're kind of leading the charge, seeing the, that the future <coughs> is there too. So I, I guess what I'd like to suggest here is that there might be some collaborative ways to incorporate consideration for swans as well as loons, maybe bald eagles, to say how can we collaborate with our manufacturing industries and our marketing industries in Minnesota to promote our outdoor traditions, but doing it in a way where, say, maybe we've got eagle-safe rifle ammo, maybe we've got loon-safe or swan-safe fishing tackle. All of these things need to be brought together so it can be 
understood easily by people when they go shopping and they want to know at their local Joe's Sporting Goods or wherever <coughs> what, what kind of tackle is available. Why is this one more expensive? Well, it's a little bit more expensive, but it's not going to kill wounds. And that, there's going to be a lot of young people who are going to buy into that. So I guess what I would like to suggest is that we don't need to wait many more years to make a decision on how we can take lead out of the formula of what we're doing in a society. Because lead is a cumulative poison. We're putting more lead out there in terms of fishing tackle and ammo every year in our lakes and wildlands. Many tons. It just keeps accumulating. It never goes away. It's still there. There's still lead in the soil from the Civil War. Those bullets never degenerated. And so I guess what I would like to do is just to uh, say I, there are some things that are, you know, this is a very honorable first step for helping the swans, and I'm very pleased about that. And uh, I checked with the Minnesota Ornithologist Union uh, this past week. They said we have now swans nesting in at least 71 counties out of 87 in Minnesota, and there's other counties where they haven't been documented yet. But they've made an incredible comeback. But now we have to look after taking care of them and making sure that, you know, they're adequately protected. But I think that uh, there are a couple of definitions in here, like what is critical habitat? I'm not sure what the word critical means. Uh, we need to take a look at that. And then migration corridors, uh, I don't know that that's legally defined anywhere. So there needs to be a little tweaking of, of, the, of the wording in, in the bill. And then I think the, probably the, mo the most problematic issue is county by county approval. There needs to be a way of building support for this in a way that doesn't drive the bill down and create so much uh, chaos, I guess I would say, or, or dissension about which lakes are going to be affected, which ones wouldn't. Uh, if we have to do this, it needs to be in a, a, a collaborative manner that I, I think uh, it, if we can tweak that and bring it into a level where we can get conservation groups agreeable on uh, how they can support this type of conservation, how we can look after the swans. There's nothing more sickening than coming upon, let's say, a dying eagle, a dying swan, a dying loon, and you realize there's nothing you can do. All you can do is just wait for it to die and then put it in the freezer. Uh, that's, I've seen this far too many times in my 44 years with the DNR, and it, most of the time it was not because they were being illegally shot or injured, or maybe it was an accident. But the, when you see these dying for a reason that's really not necessary, we can eliminate the lead poisoning as a whole issue, not just for swans, but for loons, for bald eagles, for golden eagles, for many other species. And then also from that incidental input where for people who shoot deer with lead bullets butcher their deer, they take it home and they feed it to their spouse and their kids. And they never tell the people what kind of bullet they used. If more spouses ask, what kind of bullet did you shoot my deer with? And I have to cook it now. I think there'd be a lot of spouses throwing that deer in the garbage because it would contain lead fragments. And that's something that we need to realize that if we're serious about R3 in the DNR, recruiting young hunters and young anglers, we don't want to be teaching them to spread more lead in the environment. So all of these things, you know, in, in the big picture of my 44 years, I had a lot to share here today. <laughs> but I, I just want to let Hendrick uh, suggest that I really appreciate what Representative Hansen is accomplishing here. And if there's anything I can do to participate in your discussions, uh, I'm happy to do so. Except I'm going to be spending the first half of April in Trinidad. Well, well, hopefully we'll have our discussion today, so don't go too far. Um, and next on my list for testimony is Dawn Tanner. Thank you. And thank, thank you. you for your testimony, Mr. Henderson. Welcome to the committee, uh, Ms. Tanner. Please uh, introduce yourself for the tape and then proceed. Thank you. Hi, Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm Dawn Tanner, and I work as the Program Development Coordinator at the Badness Lake Area Water Management Organization. I'm here because 
an important part of my job has been collecting a lot of these swans that Carol Henson mentioned. And when they are dying of lead poisoning, poisoning, it's highly visible. So I'm here. I want to thank you for bringing forward the Swan Protection Act, House File 2368. I think that this is an excellent step in protecting our environment and our wildlife from lead sinkers by designating swan resting areas, increasing education, and offering lead tackle exchanges to non-lead safe alternatives. I've been part of this effort to collect swans. We're collecting data and reporting about swan deaths due to lead poisoning. At a single location since 2019, we've had a, at least 26 swans that have died at Vadnesucker Lakes Regional Park in Vadnes Heights. The most recent one was last Tuesday. The Ramsey County took on an effort to try to capture that swan and bring it in where it may have been able to receive help. As Carol mentioned also, usually by the time people are seeing these swans that are dying of lead poisoning, it's too late to do anything. That swan died. Um, but people got out there, they got involved, and they tried to do something. And I really appreciate what you are trying to do here today, too. This location is important because it focuses swan activity during the winter months when it's coldest, because the water doesn't freeze over, because our drinking water for St. Paul and surrounding communities is being pumped through this area. That's what keeps the water open, and that's what focuses the swan activity at this location. It's shallow in the channel, and the swans, as they're concentrated there, are picking up this lead tackle. As Carol mentioned, lead accumulates over time. It's accumulating in our drinking water. When the swans die and we aren't able to get to them, that lead has been mobilized into their body tissues. It's being put directly back into our drinking water. The Minnesota DNR, Ramsey County, and the Vadnes Lake Area WMO all receive calls regularly from concerned citizens who see these swans dying a slow and highly visible death. Citizens contact us with the hope that the swans can be successfully treated. In reality, even if the swans are successfully captured and transported, they usually do not survive because the lead poisoning is too far advanced. These deaths are preventable. Safe economic alternatives to lead tackle are available. And I thank you for taking this step to work to protect our swans at Badness Sucker Park and other locations in the state of Minnesota. Thank you, Ms. Tanner. Next on my list for testimony is Dr. Dale Gentry, Conservation Manager, Audubon, Minnesota. Welcome to the committee, Dr. Gentry. Please uh, restate your name for the tape and then proceed with your testimony. Sure. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee. My name is Dale Gentry. I'm the Director of Conservation for Audubon, Minnesota. Uh, trumpeter swans were once one of the rarest birds in the world. In 1935, there were 69 known individuals in the United States. And at that point, either they'll go extinct or they will rebound. And fortunately, uh, with the protection against hunting, that population ha has rebounded. And we're delighted to see them now nesting in our lakes in Minnesota. Uh, uh, that should be a word of encouragement to us that we can recognize the cause of problems. We can dr come up with solutions. And we can have positive uh, conservation outcomes. Uh, and as we study the populations of our native swans, tundra swans and trumpeter swans, in areas where they coexist with high human use of activities like fishing, what we find are that, um, is that lead poisoning is the number one cause of death. And we heard that testimony about what's happening at, at Badness Lake in, uh, in Badness Heights. And, and that is exactly the, the, the story that the science supports as well. And so Audubon is excited about this a uh, positive step in the protection of trumpeter swans, which, is, which are a species of uh, special concern for the Minnesota DNR. And we believe that the, uh, this uh, act would benefit not only swans, trumpeter swans and tundra swans, but numerous other waterfowl and loons. Uh, and as, as Carol pointed out, uh, there is no safe <coughs> amount of lead in, in in a bird's system. And so when they ingest these sinkers and jigs, which they mistake for the little stones that they eat to help them digest their, their food, uh, just one of those is enough to kill a, a very large bird like a, a swan. So um, we are aware of the problem. We have viable solutions since uh, we already have an, a great supply of, of uh, non-toxic tackle available. And so we ask for your support to help make that um, that uh, change in how we, uh, we recreate in our state. Thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anyone else in the audience that would like to testify for or against the bill? Okay. First on my list is Representative Liz Lagarde. 
Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I don't know if it's for the next test last testifier, but um, you said the swans have rebounded. What is the population um, of the swans, the estimate? Dr. Gentry? That's a great question, and I'm afraid I don't know <laughs> the, the answer to it. Um, they're, they're, uh, when their population was as low as it was, there were no swans in, in Minnesota for a while. You know, that they can only go up. But uh, as Carol said, they're now breeding in a majority of the counties in Minnesota. The population is increasing, and we're happy to see that, but their population is not at a place where, where we're comfortable with, you know, a, a stable long-term population just yet. Uh, Representative Blissegard. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Is there a way that we could kind of just find out or, you know, somebody could give us a rough estimate? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yep. All right, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Uh, Representative Edelson. Thank you, um, Madam Chair, Mr. Chair. Um, very supportive of the bill. I have a few questions. Um, more of an education person here and, and health policy, but there is a health component to this that's really interesting. Um, so if swans are dying, and many of the testifiers are talking about lead uh, being in the water, and I'm reading some of the letters from sportsmen, uh, sports fisher fishers, saying they have concerns. I guess I have a few questions is, I see that New York, Maine, Massachusetts, Vermont, New Hampshire all have really limited lead tackle. Um, how many waters would be impacted by this? Because I'm very supportive of, of that. It looks like there's alternatives. Um, so I guess I'll start with that question, and then I have another one. Representative Hansen. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. So we provide the authority to the DNR to designate those areas. Uh, so at this moment, we can't tell you that. We want to use science as the, as the driver on it. And that's why the bill has the component for education and also the million dollars for the providing the alternatives uh, for the tackle. And some of those alternatives, uh, just to maybe reference Rep Representative Lizelgard, you know, they may be tungsten. Uh, when you're talking about ammunition, that may have been copper. Copper, those types of other metals. So. Representative Edelson. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Okay, well, that, that's, that's helpful. Um, I, I guess there must be patterns in which swans work, and I don't know a great deal about that. Maybe you could just tell me a little bit more. <laughs> Representative Hansen. Madam Chair, and maybe I would uh, ask uh, Mr. Henderson to come forward because he is the expert. Uh, Mr. Henderson, would you be willing to come educate us? And that recovery effort that has occurred, I would just note, if there's one person responsible, it's Carol Henderson. Can you repeat the question again, please? Representative Edelson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and to the testifier, my question was in terms of uh, how the DNR is going to determine which water the swans will be using so that they know which ones are protected. What are the patterns look like for swans so that we would know as a committee? Mr. Henderson. Okay. Well, the, the, the patterns are going to be confusing at first, uh, to say the least. The trumpeter swans require about four years to maturity. So they'll pair up maybe when they're two, they'll spend a year with their partner when they're three, and when they're four, then they'll start nesting. So during those first couple of years, there are groups of swans, could be 30, 50, 60 or more swans, and flocks of what you might call the teenager swans, just moving around the state and visiting different places, checking out marshes where they might nest someday. And so in terms of their local movement behavior for the sub-adult swans, uh, they're going to be very mobile. And it, it isn't what you would call a traditional migration in the terms of flying south and north. Uh, the swans do migrate in the fall, usually quite late in the fall. They may go down to Iowa, Arkansas, Missouri, uh, some of the more southeasterly, but more central states. They don't go too far south. But th the other thing is that uh, some of the swans stay around through the winter wherever there's open water. If you have a reservoir with a uh, uh, water plant or along a river, uh, <coughs> then some of the swans will stay here throughout the winter. They don't truly mag migrate, but they might migrate, say, from northern Minnesota down to... Uh, you know, they used to go uh, in big numbers to Monticello, uh, but they might go to uh, the St. Croix River and other places. So all of these movements 
really confuse the issue of what we call migration. And these um, shoveling, uh, shuttling movements that the birds do during the year are going to make it complicated in terms of how do you monitor or map the use of the swans on these different wetlands. Are they using it more in the fall or the winter, spring? Uh, all of this is going to require an incredible amount of documentation, which will be a big challenge. And so I guess that's one of the reasons why I, I think this would be a, a daunting challenge for people who are trying to figure out, you know, what are the lakes or places where th this would be uh, more uh, enforceable or more desirable for the benefit of the swans. Representative Edelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, um, I would support a full uh, transition to um, to more eco-friendly options. Um, but of course, I'm sure that there's lots of resistance to this, um, as other states probably have witnessed. Um, I guess the last question I just want to know is, with the lead tackle collection program, how is how exactly is that going to work? And then I'll be done. <coughs> Representative Hansen. Madam Chair, I, th I believe we have the Pollution Control Agency was here earlier, but. Mr. Johnson. I'll, I'll let the folks from the Pollution Control Agency fight it out. Okay, I see, Rep I see uh, Mr. Johnson's coming down. And Representative Edelson, I would, um, there has been legacy grants that have gone towards some of that tackle um, collection, and there are lots of organizations that do tackle exchanges, um, including one in your <coughs> district, I believe, um, at Bush Lake with the Isaac Walton League. So they might have some good resources for you. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, Tom Johnson, uh, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Um, we have a, an existing Get Out the Lead program. It's very uh, successful in, in providing areas for, for folks to drop off uh, uh, lead tackle if they should so wish to uh, help remove that from the system if they're doing their own transition. So that's a voluntary program. Uh, certainly, this funding would help expand collection sites, et cetera. Um, so, uh, I can follow up with the committee on a more comprehensive um, overview of the program, if that's helpful. I think that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it would be nice to get the agency tasked with so many of the duties and enforcement to speak to the bill. So could DNR come down? Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself, um, and then we'll go back to Representative Heinzman for the questions. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, I'm Katie Smith, Director of the Ecological and Water Resources Division at Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for coming down. There's just a number of uh, uh, specific uh, directions in the bill. I just was wondering if you've uh, read through it and if you have any observations that could be helpful to the committee. Uh, sorry, Director Smith. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Heinzman, um, the, the recovery of trumpeter swans in Minnesota has been a remarkable conservation success, as other testifiers have mentioned. Um, maybe to Representative Lislegard's question, uh, the 2019 waterfall survey estimated the trumpeter population in Minnesota to be 23,000. They are regular and widely distributed breeders across the state in virtually every county. Um, trumpeter swans continue to expand their range and dramatically increase in number, but they do still face threats to their population and are a state-listed species of concern. Um, tundra swans migrate through Minnesota and frequently congregate in large numbers uh, along the Mississippi River in the fall. Um, some specific comments and, and questions on the bill. Um, swan protection area is not explicitly defined, um, however the entire state is part of the swan migration corridor in the central Mississippi flyways. Therefore, many of Minnesota's most popular fishing lakes would be impacted by a lead sinker ban on waters. And DNR could make a map available, but um, it'll be this map I could, I could provide to huh. committee members. Um, And uh, sinkers do have non-toxic alternatives, but availability may be limited, particularly you know, considering the size of this impacted area. Um, implementation and operations will be costly expenses for the DNR, many of which would be ongoing for assessment and designation of waters for the presence of swans, 
public engagement in compliance with the non-toxic requirement. Um, the DNR did not receive a fiscal note request for this particular bill, but for a similar bill last year, the cost was estimated at $5 million. Um, but we'd be glad to continue talking to the author about these items. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. Uh, an additional question is more of a personal one. I've, 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 I've got a number of nesting pair that have been frequently on the pond in front of my home. And I'm just curious if my observation is something that is normal or uh, of any concern whatsoever. I probably could um, ignore it to some extent. But for many, many years, I had nesting loon, loons on my lake. And as soon as I found uh, or observed trumpeting swans there, um, that changed. Is, is it? And they're gone. So I'm wondering, is there any negative interactions um, we all love swans. I love seeing them, and so there's a part of me that's indifferent to it. But if there is an impact, or if, we're our, if we are observing a negative impact, um, are we are we tracking that? Director Smith, uh, Madam Chair, Representative Heinzman, um, I can't speak to your exact concern. Um, we do receive complaints in the non-game wildlife program about you know swan damage of crops, um, including like commercial wild rice harvest, but. I can um, look into that question and get back to you. Would perhaps Dr. Gentry know the answer to that? So, um, Dr. Yes. Gentry. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Madam Chairperson and committee. Uh, swans, like most species, are territorial against their own species, but tend not to be competitive with other species, which presumably because they're not competing for the same food source. That's not to say that it couldn't happen, but it would be, I think, uncommon since, since they aren't competing for food. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Chair. Is there any research that you could cite that I could look at so I could kind of dive into that a little bit? Because I am wondering what happened in my own, yeah. on my own pond, and it's been something that's been confirmed as I visited with other folks that have observed similar behavior. Yeah, I, I would be happy to look into it for you and share with you what I find and, and can recommend some some places to look for their, for, for their information on your own as well. Yep. Representative Heisman. Thank you, Chair. Just a couple of things for the committee to consider. And, you know, it'd be nice to have the facts um, as we're understanding, you know, the impacts of the legislation. That sounds like we are a few things uh, Representative Hansen, that we should probably be looking a little more closely at, including maybe the definition of of the uh, lead sinkers specifically. Um, but we can talk about that offline. Representative Hansen. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, members. Uh, happy to be looking at tweaks and changes. You know, uh, uh, Carol Henderson providing suggestions, uh, I think, is very helpful, as well as the DNR and the other scientists. We want to make sure that this is scientifically sound as well as being uh, um, effective for the taxpayer as well. So happy to look at that. It is being laid over so we can work on it. Great. Uh, Representative Scrabo. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, perhaps, uh, uh, Mr. Henderson, Henderson, if I a question for you. If, thank you. Um, w one of the things I Again, I guide canoe trips up in the wilderness, and I did a paper on these in eighth grade, the uh, endangered species of the loon, and that was in the 70s, so that's dating myself. But <clears throat> I've always been fascinated with the trumpeter swan. The trumpeter swan has been like the, the comeback kid. It, it, it was gone, and now it's here. Last year during the floods up in Rainy River, Rainy Lake, I flew a, a beaver airplane from Ely up there, I quit counting at 50 nesting. Wow. There's white in every pond, everywhere. They're, they have found a home. You know, um, I guide canoe trips on Crooked Lake for 40 plus years. Never saw a swan uh, in the last six years. There's nesting pairs. There's, uh, they do chase geese. The geese don't, they, there's competition there. Um, <clears throat> there right now, as we speak, there are swans on Shagwa River in Ely. Um, they're up there early. They're getting earlier and earlier and earlier. Um, we used to have nesting pairs on Ella Hall, the first ones that we ever saw up there. And now 
there's families of them. They are very successful and they adapt. It seems like they adapt. But I, I uh, like uh, Representative Heinzman, I'm curious about the interaction with ducks, with geese, and, and with loons for him. If you have an answer, please. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Chair, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, you've asked some really good questions and, and brought up some interesting facts here. One is that the swans are much more intolerant of the Canada geese. So they will tend to drive those out of their territory. But when I was collecting trumpeter swan eggs in Alaska back in 1986, 70, 87, and 88, we flew in on float planes, we taxied up to the trumpeter swan nest, and then I got out in my chest waders and sometimes sunk in and sometimes didn't, <laughs> and uh, collected the eggs. Uh, we would leave two live eggs in the nest and take the rest for bringing back to Minnesota. In two cases, the loons and the swans were nesting within 25 to 30 feet of each other. And I think what was happening is that the loon was benefiting from the much larger territorial defense of that area so that if some creature came into that territory, the swan chased away the creature, the bear or whatever it was, and the loon just hunkered down and let the swan do all the work. So at least that was my hypothesis for why they would tolerate each other so closely. Uh, so I don't have any direct evidence of any uh, competition between the two because uh, they do have a, quite a different lifestyle in terms of their food habits and so forth. So I, I guess uh, I'm not sure what might have been going on at the lake where you were where the maybe there were uh, different territorial requirements for, for the birds that were involved there. And maybe that's just an adaptation that's happened in Alaska, which it, where they, there's kind of a, uh, a peaceful coexistence where the, the, the loons benefit from having swans on their lake. Uh, so that would be my initial uh, response to uh, what was going on there. Great. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Um, you can stay there. Uh, oh. Representative Brand. <laughs> Yeah, just an observation. Uh, when we're talking about swans, and it's really important to point out all the work that was done to kind of bring swans back to Minnesota. It was in the 1930s that there was about 70 swans left in the 48 states, right? And in the, in the 1880s um, in Minnesota, swans disappeared altogether. Right, about 1883, over, 84. Over harvesting. Now we've got Swan uh, Lake Township in Stevens County. We've got Swan Lake. There's a big Swan Lake near Dassel where my grandparents used to have a, a lake home. I've got a Swan Lake, which is the largest prey pothole in the United States. <laughs> That's in Nicola County. There's a Swan Lake in the Bonjour Waters Canary area. We've got Swan Lakes and Swan names everywhere, but for a very long time in Minnesota, we had no swans. And so I think it's really important to say that, you know, we've got about 30,000 swans now in Minnesota, and it's due to an awful lot of conservation work, an awful lot of work to get these things accomplished to bring these folks back, uh, these, these um, swans back. And so I just wanted to recognize that and say there was Thank a time you. there was none. Right. And, and I appreciate that, those comments very much. And I had mentioned that since we initiated the project, we've had Minnesota swans dispersed into North and South Dakota, southeastern Manitoba, southwestern uh, Ontario. And so they are also benefiting from those Minnesota swans because of the dispersal that's been going on with the species. So it, it's been, uh, the people from Manitoba took me up there in the uh, uh, early 2000s to say, how, what lakes would be good ones where we can re reintroduce swans? And I said, you don't need to reintroduce anything. They're going to find their way there, and it'll be free, <laughs> and they did. <laughs> so it, it's it's been a really nice success story, and hopefully we can experience a, a few more nice successes along the way. Thank you, uh, Representative Brand and uh, Mr. Henderson, for, for your testimony and all of your years of work on this. Representative Hansen, would you like to uh, make any closing comments? Thank you, Madam Chair. This is a different bill from what was introduced last year. Um, I expect that what we put in the omnibus bill will be different than the bill that's in front of us based on the testimony that's here. But the intent is to have a comprehensive bill that provides education, incentives, uh, a consequence for poaching, but also try to protect swans uh, through a scientific manner. I'd ask for your support and I renew my motion at House File 2368 
as amended be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill. Representative Hansen renews his motion that House File 2368 as amended be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. The bill is laid over. Uh, last on our agenda today is House File 2761. Um, Representative Hansen, would you like to move this bill? Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd move House File 2761 be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill. And Representative Hansen, I believe there is an A2 author's amendment. Would you like to explain that amendment and move it? Thank you, Madam Chair uh, and members. The A2, I move the A2 amendment, and what this does is it removes uh, the appropriations for the Department of Agriculture and the Department of Health, um, and it also uh, clarifies that it's all within the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. Uh, what this does is it um, will re result in the bill not having to go to Chair Vang's committee uh, or to Chair Liebling's committee. Um, and I would ask for your support. Representative Hansen moves the A2 amendment to get the bill in the form he would like. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. And the motion prevails, the A2 amendment is adopted. Representative Heinzman. I was hoping to have an opportunity prior to the amendment going on, but we've passed that. We can talk about the amendment when we talk about the bill. Um, Representative Hansen to the bill as amended. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and members. So uh, we have, with the amendment, uh, Representative Heinzman, we have deleted uh, section five, the biomonitoring. And on page three, uh, deleted subdivisions one and subdivision three. So there would not be a biomonitoring provision for the Department of Health, and there would not be a provision for the Department of Ag for doing uh, the the grain uh, assessment. So what that leaves is uh, it, the commissioner, the PCA, must sample and test dried distillers, grains, and other ethanol, biodiesel, and advanced biofuel co-products uh, for the presence of neonicotinoids and perfluoral, uh, polyfluoral substances. And what's left in the bill after the amendment is that would be for uh, air and for water. Uh, and why is this bill here? Uh, members in uh, Chair Vang's committee, we had testimony that neonicotinoids, that, excuse me, PFAS are in several pesticides. And we've had bill after bill after bill in this committee about PFAS. And so what this says is if we have PFAS and pesticides, and PFAS are professed are persistent chemicals, and we also have evidence of neonicotinoids being persistent pesticides throughout the plant where they are applied as a seed treatment. It would be prudent for us to look at biofuels on where they're being produced where those products are being used as a food stock. Um, as I have discussed with the Pollution Control Agency, since the amendment has been drafted, it appears that it, is, it would be very difficult for air monitoring at this time. And so it would be my intent as this is laid over that this would be uh, for uh, really looking at wastewater discharge uh, for, with the existing permits to look for neonicotinoids and PFAS at these plants. And I know there are several testifiers. There are, and first on the list is Brian Warner from the Minnesota Biofuels Association. Welcome to the committee, Mr. Warner. Please uh, restate your name for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Chair Hansen and members of the committee, my name is Brian Warner and I'm the executive director of the Minnesota Biofuels Association. I appreciate the opportunity to testify on our association's concerns with House File 2761, legislation to require monitoring and testing for treated seed and PFAS at biofuel facilities. I wanna be very clear. No ethanol plant in the state of Minnesota accepts pesticide-treated seed corn as a feedstock for biofuel production. Guidance released by the Pollution Control Agency and Department of Agriculture in March 2022 specifically prohibits treated seeds from being used for ethanol, biodiesel, or other fermentation or oil processing. If an individual facility hypothetically decided to move forward with utilizing treated seed as a feedstock, 
they would be required to obtain a permit from MPCA, which would include subsequent monitoring, testing, and reporting. Biofuel plants across the state of Minnesota are highly committed to following all federal and state laws, regulatory requirements, guidance, and protocols to protect against the unintentional introduction of treated seed corn into, ethanol, into the ethanol production process, ethanol production facilities inspect all grain shipments upon arrival and reject any inbound shipment if treated seed corn is detected. Furthermore, in addition to state guidance and permitting, the Federal Food Safety Modernization Act requires ethanol production facilities to adopt current good manufacturing practices and preventative controls to ensure the safety of co-products that are used in animal feed. All ethanol production facilities are inspected annually to ensure compliance with FSMA safety plans, which include protocols for testing distillers' grains and corn oil, as well as restrictions on where those products can be sold if contamination is found. Finally, with respect to PFAS monitoring and testing, methods for determining the presence of PFAS in air emissions, biofuel, and biofuel co-products are still undergoing thorough testing and have yet to be validated by the federal EPA. We have concerns about subjecting ethanol production plants to monitoring requirements based on draft testing methods that have not been through a, through a complete federal rulemaking process. The use of non-validated methods will lead to test results that do not accurately reflect the presence of PFAS. I will close by saying that we share a common goal, the protection of Minnesota's environment and the public health of its residents. That's why the focus of the biofuel industry in Minnesota has been the safe and efficient production of renewable fuels, which are helping to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and improve our air quality. We are committed to working with Representative Hansen and the rest of the committee to eliminate chemical pollution in a meaningful and constructive way that isn't duplicative of existing state and federal guidelines and regulations. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you for your testimony. Next on my list is Joe Smentek from the Minnesota Soybean, Soybean Growers Association. Welcome to the committee. Please restate your name for the record and then proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, as stated, my name is Joe Smentek. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Soybean Growers Association. Uh, I'm also here on behalf of the Minnesota Biodiesel Council. Uh, Mr. Youngerberg, who is their Executive Director, has been under the weather and was not able to join tonight. I'm mostly here uh, in, my, in my role assisting the Biodiesel Council uh, to bring a little light to this bill. Uh, as Mr. Warner uh, mentioned, um, you know, there are right now draft water testing and some air testing things going on at EPA, uh, but there are no um, approved methods as of right now at EPA to do the testing for this. Uh, for the feedstocks in the biodiesel industry, we don't accept seeds at all. Um, the biodiesel plants in the state of Minnesota accept oils. Uh, there is no nothing that comes out of a biodiesel plant that is marketed as a commercial feed. Um, we don't have DDGs like an ethanol plant. So we, the, the crushing is done at a biodiesel or a soybean crush plant where you'll get meal and you'll get oil. Um, the USDA, uh, FDA have never found PFAFs or uh, neonics in the soybean oil. The hexane extraction process that it undergoes uh, has not, it, we, the, none of those chemicals have been found to survive that process. Uh, the soybean seeds themselves that are being crushed uh, when they do need to use a neonic treated seed has minimal residue re or maximum residue levels that are enforced by USDA for export standards. Uh, in the seed themselves, those levels are found and marketed as less than 0 0.01 parts per million, uh, which is the, the lowest level they can give and is virtually indetectable. Uh, so we have concerns about subjecting Minnesota's biofuel plants, um, biodiesel, renewable hydrocarbon diesel, and sustainable, sustainable aviation fuel plants uh, if we do get those latter two plants in the state. Uh, to these, uh, these testing requirements as these chemicals are not present in our seed in the first place. Uh, further, the California Health and Safety Code, Section 57004, uh, requires multimodal evaluations. Uh, those multimodal evaluations have found that biodiesel and renewable hydrocarbon diesel are no worse than, and in most metrics, better for environmental impacts and public health 
than petroleum diesel. In no instance uh, has either of the chemicals been found in either one of those fuels in the state of California uh, under their renewal, low carbon fuel standard. So in summary, uh, you know, I, I would hope that you guys would follow the science uh, as was stated with the Swan Bill and not impose this unnecessary testing for chemicals that are not present in the feedstocks that go into biodiesel plants. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Last on my list is Chris Cowan from the Pesticide Action Network. Welcome back to the committee, Mr. Cowan. Please uh, restate your name for the tape and then proceed with your testimony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, my name is Chris Cowan and I'm a contract lobbyist with the Pesticide Action Network. Uh, generally, our work is uh, to try to keep people safe uh, from the use of pesticides and our environment and pollinators included. Um, just a few comments uh, about the bill. We, we, we uh, speak in favor of House File uh, 2761. Um, one of the letters submitted to committees uh, brings up the point that the that there's the presence of PS, uh, PFAS is nearly universal and um, I don't find that beginning point for an argument to be very reassuring that it is everywhere um, so we need to look for it uh, where it is. Um, I don't think looking for it uh, in ethanol plants is, is irresponsible. Um, what if it turns out that uh, folks in ethanol plants are exposed more to PFAS than other places? Um, the, uh, my concern with this, the use of the word irresponsible, I, I need to touch on this, uh, um, is what happened in Mead, Nebraska and the ethanol plant there. And what happened there isn't a one-off thing. It's true, it's, it's one ethanol plant, and as the letter says, uh, one out of two in the country. But uh, by their own uh, promotion uh, marketing, the uh, owners of the plant said that 98% of the uh, treated seed in North America went to that plant, and they had long-term contracts with large agricultural entities, uh, most of whom have uh, ties to the uh, state of Minnesota when you're talking about uh, what they refer to, and that uh, those same entities, those same companies have spent, according to court documents, $28 million in the last two years trying to treat, clean up the mess in Mead, Nebraska. Um, I'm sorry, but I think it's irresponsible to, to ignore that record. Um, because when you look at it day after day, month after month, year after year, from about 2015 to 2021, millions of pounds of treated seed went to a single ethanol plant in Mead, Nebraska, where it was burned to make ethanol and they tried to sell the feedstock. And then they tried to dispose of the feedstock on their own grounds. And now six companies are, have voluntarily uh, decided that they would lead the effort to try to clean that all up under the law in Nebraska. Um, as far as, I, so I think as long as we're in the shadow of that, we do need to be very careful to be looking at uh, neonics and PFAS uh, in ethanol plants. Um, as far as being ahead of the EPA, uh, I think Minnesotans should be proud that as far as PFAS goes, uh, I think we've been ahead of the EPA for quite a while and I think that the residents of Washington and Ramsey counties are very happy that the state of Minnesota is ahead of the EPA. It was yesterday that the EPA came out with the standards for uh, PFAS in uh, drinking water and four trillion, okay, four units out of a trillion being the standard. So there was just reference here to 0 .01 uh, uh, units out of a million. Well. I, I can't do the math off the top of my head, but that's, uh, that's a lot more than uh, four, uh, four trillionths, um, four units out of a trillion. So um, the, other, the last point that I'll make is, is that um, there's still, okay, the, the uh, Pollution Control Agency did come out with a fact sheet uh, uh, that covers some of this. but. 
if you go to the pesticide environmental stewardship uh, website like I did today and look at the uh, some of the advice that they give on how to deal with treated seed number four in their list of dealing with large quantities of pesticide treated seed they have fermentation in an alcohol producing uh, process at an ethanol plant some ethanol plants may be able to use treated seeds in the fermentation process and then it goes on to say in addition some ethanol plants may be able to use treated seed as an alternate power source so in light of PFAS uh, in light of the record in uh, Mead Nebraska and how long that went on uh, I think it's totally appropriate that something like uh, house file uh, 2761 uh, uh, be enacted into law um, so that Minnesotans and others can rest assured that uh, there is no problems uh, uh, with what's going on in those plants. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience that would like to testify for or against the bill? Uh, seeing none, I will go to Representative Heinzman. So I'm going to point to uh, subdivision nine it's on page one just had a quick question for representative Hansen I see advanced biofuel co-products in line 1.12 and then in 1.13 I'm seeing commercial feed is mentioned is is that not something that is directly connected to agriculture and potentially in the jurisdiction of the Agriculture Committee representative Hansen thank you uh, madam chair and representative Heinzman and that was my error in the amendment that subdivision 9 is supposed to be deleted uh, because that ties back to the part on subdivision 1 section 6 so that ag portion they would be looking at the feedstock that would be my intent to strike that so what you would have left of the bill is section 2 subdivision 12 where the national pollution discharge elimination system uh, disposal permit is being looked at so really it's going to be looking at wastewater and then it would have the life cycle analysis or the assessment on page 3 and that would be the Commissioner of PCA that was in the change in the amendment in consultation with the Commissioner of Ag a life cycle assessment to the presence of neonicotinoid pesticide in the production of ethanol biodiesel advanced biofuel including food stacks so essentially that is a study representative Heinzman no further questions thank you further questions from members uh, representative Hansen closing comments then thank you madam chair and members uh, the bill uh, as you can see uh, we've taken some con comments take those seriously uh, take the testimony seriously uh, and we will continue to lay this over for possible inclusion I renew my motion uh, to uh, that 2761 be laid over for possible inclusion in the omnibus bill representative Hansen renews his motion that house file 2761 as amended be laid over for possible inclusion in an omnibus bill and the bill is laid over. Uh, members, we've concluded our business for the day. I think there will be more communication about further meetings. Um, and with that, we are adjourned.